My name's Emily Martin, and I'm taking you behind the scenes to talk to equine artists from around the world. This is Artist Unlocked. Hey, what's up, you guys? We are back with another Artist Unlocked episode, and this week's guest is Jackie and Heather of the Mares in Black podcast. Many of you guys listen to the Mares in Black podcast, and I know they were super influential when I decided to make this show. The Mares in Black podcast has been so influential to the model horse hobby in general and just building community, and of course they offer hobby news, so it's a a one-stop shop for all of those types of things. So thank you, Jackie and Heather, for all of your continued support for the show. It was an honor to have you on, and I hope you guys enjoy. So um, I'm Jackie Rossi. Uh, I was Jackie Arns for a long time, but not anymore. Um, I've been in the hobby uh, on some level since the early 80s. Like I think I started photo showing then, kind of got really into live showing in the 90s and was very involved in NAMSA for a very long time. Um, And now I'm just a cranky podcaster um, (laughs) with some nice horses. (laughs) Fair. Yes, yeah, that's, I think that's accurate. Um, I, I am Heather Malone Vogel. I got my first briar when I was four. Um, I grew up in Germany, so I, I had very limited um, interaction with the hobby stateside until I was like 11 or 12 when we moved back. Um, and then I threw myself into um, kind of the by mail hobby at the time because there was no internet, if you can imagine. So everything was done through mail and phone calls. Um, and then I abandoned the hobby when I was in high school and college. I had, I was competing real horses. There were boys, there were parties, you know, there was, I went through this whole activist phase. Um, and like through that? Oh, yeah. I got it's, it's just you're done. It's <laughs> No, but I mean, actually going out like kids are doing now yeah. for Black Lives Matter. Like, I, if I was 20 years younger, it would still be me or 30 years, yeah. actually. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, when I came back to the hobby, I, I um, had finished school and had my first, like, real job. And I and had some money. And I was like, what whatever happened to the hobby? Right? And the internet was here. This was 90. I want to say this was 93 or 94. And I was like wonder whatever happened to that fun hobby and it was like oh okay (laughs) it's much bigger much more organized so I just kind of threw myself in with zeal when I was like 25 and never looked back (laughs) that's awesome yeah it's interesting to talk to people about how they came about and that whole journey because you're right like I I'm 21 and so like I don't really know the hobby without the internet side of it and it's cool how you guys like banded together before that was a thing because we're all so spread out (laughs) yeah I mean it was all through just about horses was a huge connecting place there were all these newsletters um, or lots of clubs too so you could get show through the clubs and everything took forever like you'd see a horse for sale and you would send off you know a letter with a self-addressed stamped envelope and hope that you know you got a reply back that yes it was still available i mean so like a selling transaction could take months yeah yeah and people i think one of the most interesting things is people would buy horses from customizers sight unseen yeah you would get um like carol howard's magazine or uh uh, what was the one Tina Farrow one that Paula Hecker took over? Um, um, Hobby, Hobby Horse News, but she had photos well, by that point. some of them they were, did. They were, but like, you would get a, you know, a, a sales list. I have a sales list from Barbara Prestige Jones, who was a big deal. Right. And it was like a hundred horses on it. And one, I got it and it was outraged because these horses were over a hundred bucks a piece. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I went to my one local friend and was like, can you believe this? highway robbery but like the whole list is and they were finished so it wasn't like you were customizing them right the whole list was like you know stock horse stallion remade to a canter because that was a very popular and easy thing to do and painted bay with these markings and a mohair tail and you know so that that's what you would be buying the horses yeah. off wow. yeah it was a, just a physical description and even if you got a picture it was a little tiny um, mimeographed or copied and it was super pixely and you couldn't tell anything anyway you got a general idea of how something looked every once in a while people would include a drawing yeah oh yeah 
could yeah, be yeah. that or could be not. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys like ever buy off of those and like have a wildly different horse arrive than what you thought? Not wildly, but I bought a horse off of Carol Hale. Um, and Carol Hale was renowned for her sport horses. And she mm. was she was the cream of the crop at the time, right? Like at the forefront of customizing the horse. She would do little floss means, braided means and tails and and I actually had a color picture because this was this was the 90s, so there was a little bit of internet at that point, but you still got like physical pictures of things to buy them sometimes. And I got it in person and it from the picture to how it looked in person was very different. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a little rougher. It wasn't, you know, and pictures, even, you know, 35 millimeter grain film pictures can lie to you. So yeah. Oh, yeah. not that, not that that wasn't Carol Hale's brilliance and I'm not criticizing her. I just had way higher expectations sure. of the horse from the picture. So Plus, if you can't see the work anyway, you're just like, yeah, it builds the right. anticipation. <laughs> so I was buying mostly OFs and, um, you know, relying on detailed descriptions of condition. And I don't remember any big disappointments. I didn't get into like buying customs and stuff until like the mid 90s. You know, when I was in vet school and I was going to get a lot less serious about this hobby. I dove, <laughs> I dove in head first, as it turned out. <laughs> like, it's a stress reliever. Yeah, it was well. What also there were there were a couple of people lo like super local. Like there were five or six of us like right in the town that we we, we could get together on the weekends and, and play with our horses. And that's what I did through vet school. Awesome. And that's, that's kind of awesome. when I got into the customs and stuff. And by then, that's where I got online. So that's where you you know you could start seeing pictures. Yeah, of. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's interesting because a lot of people either when they reach that college age, they either take a break and then come back or they take a break and never come back or they just dive head first. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm the last of those. I never I never took a break. That's awesome, though. <laughs> Maybe I, I should. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast I know, there were times during the troubles that Jackie was I, I the can't calamity this anymore. <laughs> We, we were on the board together. Um, was it the two? It was the early two thousands, I believe. Yes, because the the phone call about the great calamity was Christmas Eve two thousand and three, I believe. And we can't talk about it because we're yeah. still under NDA. But needless to say, being a board member on on NAMSA around Christmas time was not good that Intense. year. Yeah. Oh <laughs> Something gosh, happens yeah. every year. <laughs> <laughs> every so how year. Did, how did you guys meet then? Was it through that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> this is a great story, actually. So okay. um, I was the regional rep for what was Region 5 at the time. It is now Region 10. Um, Heather was the regional rep for what is for Region 6. Um, yep. 6 came on board when 10 did, so they added new reps. Um, so Heather and I were on the board. And she was there a year before me, and it's two-year right. terms. So, um, so we were um, on the board kind of together, and um, we often clashed when we when there were debates going on um because we both have very strong personalities and we um did not always agree with each other and we didn't we like were, each other and we would message yeah. mutual friends like liz boris and be like who is this person i am yeah. so sick of her. we both we both messaged liz boris and we're like who is this person and what is her problem and liz came back with you should both get over it. <laughs> You're on the same team. Uh -huh. And um, eventually we realized that we were arguing, because this is when the calamity was starting. We and were we, arguing yeah. the same points, but from slightly different angles. And we decided, Heather reached out to me to join forces because it didn't occur to me to reach out to her. Um, and here we are. <laughs> See? That's awesome. See? So yeah, so I was kind of like, yeah, I think we're kind of arguing about the same thing and something stinks in Denmark, so... Yeah. And that's how it started. Now we're best friends. Yeah. Aww, that's awesome, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you guys met, obviously, before the podcast. And so you've been friends for years. How, 20 how did now, you I go think. from... Yeah, that's awesome. How did you go from um, the friendship and just, you know, being with each other in the hobby to let's start a podcast together? <laughs> Well, I mean, we started out being like, you know, model horse friends, um, air yeah. quotes. But, um, you know, eventually you, you, don't, you talk about other things other than model horses. And, you know, that's kind of how, you know, becoming friendships, you know, that's how kind of evolved. Um, and then we talked about doing, like, we've been, 
So the idea for the podcast originally came up seven years ago. Yes. Yeah. Because I was really into listening to podcasts, and I couldn't find a model horse one. And I went to Heather, oh my god, maybe this is something we should do. I, I had sort of looked into it at the time, and didn't look too hard. And I was like, we should do this. And every year at Briarfest, for five years, we talked about it. And then we finally yeah. did it. Yeah, we, so we, to back that up, we were always looking, when we started becoming uh, really good friends, and we kind of had the same viewpoint on life, as well as mm -hmm. how things go in the model horse hobby and everything, we were like, we should have a show together, or we should do something, so we were yeah. always looking for something to partner on, right, hobby related, and then she brought the podcast into the thing, and then we're just, we're both professionals, we work all the time, and there's a whole lot of yapping and no actions. So yeah, so we were looking, we would talk about it and talk about it. And it's kind of one of those things we just kept pushing to the right, right? Cause we, we had stuff, there was always something going on. And finally Maggie Bennett, who's a mutual friend of ours was just like, you can talk about it all you want, but you should just do it. Just don't think about it, just do it. And, we, and, I, and I was like, okay. And I went and wrote the oh, first show. Microphones. Bought microphones. <laughs> that was, that's right. That was the first yep. step. I sent you a microphone for your birthday. Yeah, it was my birthday. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so this is all Maggie's fault. Yeah, basically. <laughs> really. You can blame her. Blame Maggie. <laughs> I think everybody loves her and I guess you for it because I think <laughs> it's been a huge success. I think your guys' personalities like are great on the podcast i think people listen both for the news obviously but for you guys as well <laughs> it cracks me up that people like l like to listen to us be stupid together <laughs> like like okay so last briar fest we went to which was the first briar fest that the podcast had existed over like the funniest things that would happen is heather and i'd be like walking around the covered arena like complaining to each other or something and someone would stop and go are you Heather and Jackie from Mares of Black? Like people would recognize our voices. <laughs> like, yeah. So that was so that was weird. Yeah, and that was we, funny. And then we would start getting people come visit our room, like uh, especially younger hobbyists, which oh we, yeah, which I love. And yeah. we, you know, we start having these raucous parties in our room, <laughs> all of our fans, <laughs> which awesome. is awesome. So yeah. <laughs> Is it surreal for you guys a little bit <laughs> that you uh, less so because we're you know currently kind of doing everything in our own spaces like i was looking forward to briar fest again this year to see what kind of you know foolishness would happen yeah because we had all kinds of plans to theme our room and and parties and stuff like that yeah um so it's it's a little i mean people definitely still i occasionally get an email out of the blue or a message on yeah. instagram or something like that um but yeah, it's the it's the, the people kind of coming up and being like, "Hey, yeah, it's it's minorly surreal, right? Because yeah. our hobby is bodaciously small, mm -hmm. um, and we're older members of it, so um, we've been so we around. Know, we've been around. We know yeah. people and what their stories um, have been. And uh, the most gratifying for me, as I said before, is getting the youth involved and having a relationship with the younger mm -hmm. hobbyists because. I find, and I found when I came in the hobby in my 20s, that women my age were not welcoming. Oh, they still aren't. <laughs> yeah. still, exactly. They still like, are not. And it's a combination, I think that it's a holdover from the real horse world where your knowledge base for horses is everything. Mm -hmm. So when you come into this hobby as a buck, you know, hobbyist, and you don't know anything and you're asking questions, and people just, you know, automatically turn in turn condescending, which I think is a mistake. And we don't welcome in people very well. Yeah. So that was one of the main missions was to bring the hobby to people. They could educate themselves privately. They wouldn't have to get out on message boards or, you know, message boards, listen to me on Facebook or anything uh, and be intimidated because it can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So, I mean, there's a reason a lot of the younger hobbyists are on Insta or on Snap or something like that. Because if you go on Facebook, you'll get burned down on Model Horse Anonymous or you know, yeah. Model Holics Anonymous. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, especially like, you know, when I first started in the hobby too, especially like going to live shows and stuff is so scary for the first time because you don't know anyone. Right. And you're coming, you know, probably with like not your top show string either and so you're just kind of looking to make friends <laughs> yeah right it's hard because everybody's there being competitive too so they don't necessarily have time to time or space to kind of talk 
Right. I found um, I found when I got first got in, I found it easier to go to a lot model horse show than to speak to people on the internet. Mm. Like, so I started showing before the internet, um, and I lucked out in that my the place I was living in at the time I lived in uh, Dutchess County, New York, which is roughly around Poughkeepsie, um, and it's a lot of horse country, so there were model horse people just by default. And there was a group of them that got together on a fairly regular basis and had little shows. And I found, finally found out about them and kind of like got into that group when, and they're, you know, they were happy to have somebody new because, you know, this is before NAMSA. So the stakes were super low. Right. Um, you know, and that was, you know, I made a lot, I made friends. I'm still friends. I made friends with people I'm still friends with through that group. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think I've seen like the tide shift a little bit towards more inclusion of the youth Good. too. Good. Like I think you guys are a big part of that. I think um, you know the different challenges that we've had, like Namo Pamo and stuff like that, are all like great yes. ways. Mm -hmm. Namo Pamo has been instrumental, I believe. Oh, um, I, I agree with that. I believe. 100%. I believe we have helped. Um, I, I believe. Um, the aging of the hobby now is a smaller generation and of course the the middle management right the the millennials coming into it are kinder yeah yes absolutely at least i would hope so yeah i, so, I think so <laughs> we try because <laughs> <laughs> i mean i know what it, i think we all at some level know what it feels like and i think obviously there are extroverts in the hobby but i think a lot of us are at least introverts sure. so we're extroverts mm -hmm. only with the people that we we know so it's it's nice for people to be more inclusive <laughs> yeah and i think I, I mean i think one of the things that was really hard about the hobby when nobody was around each other and it was all kind of mail order is you there's no um replacement for human interaction and i was a big old weirdo when i was i'm still a big old weirdo so yeah right that does, but I, was, that I didn't i did not fit anywhere i was a horse girl i was a book a, a, a book hound i was believe it or not i was a friggin inter, inter, introvert when i was a child <laughs> and when i when i turned 25 and kind of found the hobby again um i was like oh it's my tribe now i'm happy i know who i am and i'm mm -hmm. you know that's why i tell people don't don't be embarrassed of being a horse girl. Don't be ashamed of collecting models. Make your model horse movies, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't. Well, if fly I could your flag. Anything back was, you know, getting out of the hobby and not talking about the hobby because my friends would be like, weirdo. Yeah. If they're like that, they shouldn't be your friends. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, my friends already know I'm a weirdo. I mean, I'm still Facebook friends with some of my high school friends. Are we? Are we in each other's lives? Do we have daily conversations? No. No. Those right. people don't matter down the road normally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I felt some of that too. And I took like a small break. Um, I, I graduate in the fall. Um, Congrats. But, thank you. <laughs> but the first two years of college, I took like a break from the hobby just because I felt like I was, one, life got really busy and it's still really busy. But um, there is also that fear of judgment, but it's stupid. Mm -hmm. People are into all kinds of things. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, men don't apologize for playing with cars or trains or anything yeah. like that. You know, watching, miniature, watching baseball. <laughs> doll, yeah, right. Doll yeah. houses are acceptable. Why shouldn't little tiny horses be? And the artistry that our artists do is amazing. Yeah. Like yeah. if you show it to people and be like, look at this, they'll be like, oh, wow. Yeah. I find yeah. that part gets the most respect from like outside people too, because they recognize it as like an art instead of just all of us on our. Yeah. Know, playing with our my, my Little Ponies, which is what yeah. I think people think <laughs> well, we're doing. I, and I think Tina Belcher has been great for from Bob's Burgers has yeah. been great for horse girls because there someone actually put a horse girl in a show and yeah. she's recognizable as one of us so <laughs> she's it has little models and everything so yeah yeah that's awesome so moving back to the show side of things um what was it like for you guys starting up as far as um equipment and like the flow of things like walk me through the making of a show from start to finish so most of this is is kind of Heather's department because um, Heather, I don't have any kind of skills as far as this sort of stuff other than running my mouth. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. Um, I was a disc jockey in college. I did radio. Um, so I can sound good on a mic, although I don't always use those skills. So I kind of just come in and do my end, which is I record 
we call each other on FaceTime usually, unless it decides it's not working that day. Um, and we each record our own audio track. I then put it to Dropbox and um, Heather's partner, Josh, will take my track and her track and combine them together to make one. So there's a lot of edit, there's like a, there's a lot of post-production that I don't think people realize. Yeah. And like, we'll sit down and record, like an hour long show can take us up to two hours because of course, we're also using this as a kind of a BS session where we kind of just talk about whatever's happening and sometimes right. that stuff makes it in and sometimes <laughs> it doesn't. We're planning an outtake show at some point with all the gaffes and stupid conversations and yes. stuff that didn't make, make the air. Yeah. Yeah, I think people would love that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, so I bought the mics, like we said, and I bought us these blue mics. Yep. Yes, I have. Which are... The Yeti mic. <laughs> Yeti, they're, they're, they're reasonably priced and they're really good. They're kind of industry standard for amateur podcasters. Um, and we already both have Macintoshes, so Facebook was the thing. Um, FaceTime. Or, yeah, God. Uh, <laughs> we use like... Audacity, which is freeware, so that's not expensive. I had to switch to Audition, which I already had because I'm a graphics artist. Um, so I have the, the Adobe Suite. Um, and yeah, my partner takes the, we take the tracks, dump them, and he edits them together. And he's, he's an audiophile and a musician, so he probably puts more into it than an average podcaster does when they edit. He, he cleans us up a lot. Oh, like, yes. We bang on things and bump things and drink wine and, you know. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah. It is a good time. It is a good time. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we use Simplecast to uh, track metrics and publish. Um, and then everything else is social media, like the um, we have the Instagram, the Twitter, um, and the Facebook. And we have YouTube, which we rarely use. Uh, and then we... Um, Oh, and we have Wix for the web page. Mm, okay. Yeah. That's but awesome. it's, I mean, if you look at startup costs, we started, I'm not even counting my headphones because those came later. Yeah. Um, it, less than, startup was less than $300. Yeah. And I think unless you are making like no money at all, like it's, and you can do it even without all of that. Mm -hmm. It's such a low entry cost, but mm -hmm. um I also do think people aren't as aware of what goes on post-production wise because right, right. so I'm getting my degree currently in film and mm. I want to be a video Good. editor. That was my so, first degree was film oh, really? concentrate. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that, so you said you're a graphic designer now? Yeah, but that's kind of something I fell into when I realized yeah. that being, um, being a film major, at least when I came out was not all it was cracked up to be. I ended up working at a TV station, editing yeah. newsreels, and that sucked. And the only people that made me money were the talent. So I kind of flipped the script and I'd always been artistic and I drew and I just taught myself Photoshop and yeah. Illustrator and switched my career. So yeah. Cool. <laughs> I have an interest in graphic design. I like at times wonder if I like should have double majored or something, which probably would have killed me as far as any free time but the, the nice cool. thing about graphic design is it's all on youtube yeah youtube university you can teach yes. yourself if you have if you have the knack you can ed educate yourself yeah and i think that's like something that's more and more popular now and mm -hmm. i think I i've been in a unique situation in that like i've had scholarship opportunities that I haven't paid for all of my education but like a good chunk of it good. and especially like obviously if you want to be a doctor you need to go to school but hear that Jackie you needed to go to school <laughs> Hush. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out <laughs> Hush. Um, but for other majors especially like the artistic ones um, I don't know that I would go back to film school per se. There's so much you can learn. Even if you take $5,000 and dump it into online courses, there's so much you can learn. Yeah, I tell people um, as far as school goes for creatives, either go to a good school, a recognized school where you can network with people that are in power positions in the industry or teach yourself. Because going to something like, um, Westwood, I don't think they exist anymore. University of Phoenix is not going to afford you probably the quality education that you're going to need. 
and it's definitely not going to provide you the connections and the mentorships that you need to get into the industry. Creative work is very heavily influenced by who you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so do you guys have a favorite episode of the podcast so far? Ooh, that's tough. It is tough. I have favorite pieces of episodes. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look. I like, I mean, I, I liked the, the, the surprise you guys did on me on my birthday. I cried. Thanks, Heather. Um, <laughs> we also like recently, we recently, cause like I said, we have these side conversations and we had a, a side conversation about video games that made it into episode 35 yeah. that I forgot about. Me too. Then Mel Miller was like, can we have a gaming corner every episode? And I was like, did we have a gaming corner? She's like, oh yeah. She, and I listened to it. And I was like, oh yeah, here's like 10 minutes about, you know, and Breath of the Wild Animal and Animal Crossing and Breath of the Wild. <laughs> I have to say my favorite. So my favorite episode was the first Briar Fest and we got all the interviews from oh, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. winners of the custom contest, which yeah. was was a coup because we got Kylie Parks at the very last minute oh, and awesome. it was such a dynamic show and the rating the, the downloads were through the roof and that was a really meaningful Briar Fest too because we sat on the lawn and watched the YouTubers hold their horses up and you know celebrate their horse girl them and I swear to god we almost cried yeah, yeah. like where was this when we were kids <laughs> you know? and and it was just a really great Briar Fest. The show that came out of it was fantastic. It was the first time I thought, because the first few shows were awkward. Just because yeah, we, we didn't know we were doing other, it. We didn't know what pe people were interested in. But after that show, I was like, I think we were on to something. Like, yeah. this is enjoyable for me now, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That's great. <laughs> what were your guys' biggest challenges so far, either in before the podcast came to life or along the way? Well, we've mostly I think we battle technical issues. Technical issues are huge. Yeah, because we we I mean we have times we sit down. Okay, we're going to do this, and FaceTime won't work, or um, something. You know, there's something else. Like we'll spend an hour trying to connect on FaceTime, and then I'm like, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> she hits it. her. She <laughs> redlines. She redlines uh, a lot faster than I do. And once she hits that, she's not a good. It's not going to be good for her to talk. Yeah. So, um, so. we both also suffer from. Uh, Macintosh Anciatus, which yeah. means you get new computers. Um, I've had mine, I think, since 2014, and I need to replace it. I mean, it's a good computer, but it's slow, and it, it adds to the hassle of... Yeah, yeah and I just don't have... I think my Mini's even older than that. I don't it's like a, a year. But yeah, we both need to... And replacing a Macintosh is not cheap. So. Oh, late, late 2014. There you go. <laughs> um... It's not, yeah, that's not you. And so every once in a while, Audacity has a bunch of dropouts. Like our Jennifer show, show we'll never see the light of day because it, you know, the recording for some reason was horrible. And we didn't realize it until Josh went to edit it. And he was like, oh my God. I, by the way, I'm still trying to get at least the core pieces of that out. Yeah. But he's, if he doesn't want to do something, it's very difficult to induce him to do so. So yeah. maybe someday it'll see the light of day. We've had several people ask for the Jennifer show, show. Um, and so hopefully I want to just sell the news doesn't matter anymore, right, the don't matter, but the core part talking about the show does. So yeah, hopefully someday we'll, we, we can just codicil it with saying, this is terrible. Listen, if you want to, at your own risk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's a bummer when things don't work out like that. Yeah. And especially yeah. if you don't realize it until it's too late. Cause they're yeah. like yeah. one time things that, uh, yep. so frustrating. Do you guys have any favorite memories? If that's not already what intertwined into the uh briar fest episode and things like that <laughs> I, I would say the interviews getting the interviews together those are super fun um they're, they're also to go back to the last question they are the also most uh, from a setup point of view the most challenging because you oh have yeah to... the international show that was fun yeah. yeah i put that all on jackie and she pulled it off man I but, spoke to people on almost every continent. <laughs> but trying trying to corral people that are 7 to 14 hours ahead of you is not easy. Yeah. Australia was tough. Yeah, I got Australia. They, the, my Australians were up at like 5 in the morning Yeah, for an wow. interview. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, but they were also the best part of the show. Um, and we, I, I think to go back to the winners of the, the, the custom contest, we had everybody 
And I didn't know Kylie Parks very well. She's a great girl, but you know, she's even to me is intimidating because of her talent and yeah. everybody wants a piece of Kylie. Mm -hmm. um, and she, uh, many artists in the hobby that are older that had a lot of adulation have closed themselves off pretty much from a lot of hobby interaction because it's just too much, right? Yeah. People will always try and manipulate you into doing something for them. Yeah. It's, it's tough. So um, I just, set her up a post and I was like, hey, if you're still here, can you, do you want to stop by and do an interview? And I expected her to be like, oh, I'm on a road, I'm on the plane, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, no, I'll be over. I haven't slept, but I'm down. Do you want some coffee? <laughs> and in she walks with her, you know, Kylie Beauty and her lip gloss and, a, and she brought us coffee and did the interview and it was amazing. It's one yeah. of my favorite memories of just Kylie being that bitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I hope you don't have to bleep me, but yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> She's amazing. I, um, funny enough, when I joined Instagram, I was on there a couple years before she was on there and really started blowing up. And so her and I would actually like talk a lot. And then I left the hobby at the most inconvenient time because afterwards she blew up. Right. So her and I still talk sometimes, but she's, uh, she is such a, an amazing person. She is. She really and, is. And I'm with you. I was just like, nobody knew who Kylie was before. Like I, I remember seeing her at Briar Fest Live. I can't remember if we were showing that year or we were judging or what, mm -hmm. but she bought, brought that, um, buckskin pony. That was kind of her big debut model. And I was like, who the hell is that? Is that her work? <laughs> Who is that person? She's good, right? And after that, it was just like, big lights, Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's amazingly talented. So, so yeah, so, so yeah. What about you, Jackie? My favorite. Uh, I'm terrible at these kinds of questions. Um, I mean, my one of my favorite, one of my favorite interactions that happened because of the podcast, I, I met Kenzie Williams you know, at that one Briar Fest, and the, the funniest thing, she said the funniest thing to me that I think anyone has ever said, and she, you know, we, we'd been talking a couple of days at this point, and she just went, it's so weird to hear your voice coming out of a face. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I guess it kind of is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, people are always surprised when I'm like, I hate my voice. I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate oh, really? it. Like, I like mine. You're yeah. a complete motor mouth. And I'm like, I know. I like to talk. I like to get my truth out there. But I don't like, like when I listen back to the show, I'm like, Rrr. I think everyone ah. or most people are like that to some degree. Like, I hate watching myself back on camera. Oh, I do too. Blech. I look like a I, troll under the bridge. I'm not. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's just a film school thing because like I don't know about you but I was like forced to be on camera for some classes because they just make you do Awful. it which I understand why but like I do not like to be on camera and so I'm just like a little bit traumatized from that. No that's why I wanted to be behind the scenes I want to be a writer director I didn't want to be an actress um, yeah. I did theater which is funny theater was different because you never had to see yourself play back yeah true right so I, I love doing theater. I can a, I used to do musical theater. I can actually sing. Um, it's, I'm probably shot now, but um, back then I loved that. But the minute I was in film school and they were like, will you star in my production or will you be an extra in my production? I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> gotta go. So what was your guys, or what is, I guess, your guys' vision for the show? At the end of the day, what are you hoping people get out of it? Well, I mean, I'm hoping that people enjoy it. Um, I, it, it's fun for me to do too. And I, you know, I think, I think the day it stops being fun for us is probably the day we stop. Um, but I enjoy, you know, I enjoy that people like it. I, you know, I like it when, you know, we say something, you know, we, we have a contest or something and people are just like, I love this particular part or I like, and it's, you know, or just, um, I had something where I mentioned my accent on my face my personal facebook page and a bunch of mayors and black subscribers were like oh yeah your accent is the best part and i was like i don't have an accent <laughs> you make a bunch of loons because it was all the australians too they were like oh yeah no your accent's amazing <laughs> really what accent, <laughs> what accent? <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> um vision 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 um we're not gonna get rich doing this we're oh, not no. going to be able to quit our jobs. This is, that <laughs> is not going to happen, right? Um, 
we do it because we love the hobby and we love our friends and we want to entertain them and we want to bring new people into the hobby. The part of the reason we did this is because um, magazines don't work anymore. Yeah. Um, the internet is fine, but it's really scattered. Like social media is very scattered. It's a lot to keep up with. And it was um, trying to bring more interest and uh, covering the news and new releases and events in the hobby. This seemed like a more modern way to do it. Um, and keep people informed in kind of all one place. I would like to grow our base more. We're growing slowly. Um, uh, and eventually, yes, we're going to be too old or too tired or whatever, mm -hmm. be over it. I would like to pass it on to somebody else. Like take yeah. the take the viewership, take the branding. Um, we're, trying, we're talking about getting a youth person on. We've been talking about that for like a year, but we're going to do it, I swear. Uh, maybe it becomes theirs and another partner. So that's the vision to keep it going, um, keep it relevant. Um, and keep bringing in new people to the fold. Because yeah. if you look at Kylie's followers, uh, Stormy Strikes followers, and especially, uh, what's her name, that has like a million subscribers. But Honey Heart C. Honey Heart uh, C. The, there are a lot more people out there to reach. Yeah, so. for sure. These kind of move outside of podcast land. Well, one, one more podcast question, I guess. Okay. Any tips? Yeah for people that want to start their own show? Um, I, I would say from a production point of view, well, first off, know what you want to talk about and yeah. ask yourself if you feel comfortable, you think you're up to, depending on how often you want to publish, you're up to being the personality, you have something to say, you have a point of view. Once that's, you've established that, it's like writing an outline. This is, that's actually how we do our show. I write an outline. Mm -hmm. uh, we have sections and there are subsections under it that um, talk about what's in the show, links to the stuff. Um, just be very organized with how you want to present because you can't just get on the air and start talking. It does, you know, it, it doesn't work. work. Um, and then when you are talking, um, it helps to over enunciate a little bit so you're clear like i don't my this is not really my speaking voice this is the voice i use to clients on the phone too actually yeah. mm -hmm. um it also helps to smile a little bit because that smile kind of brings your voice up um and those are those are things that i was taught doing radio yeah you have to you have to emote you can't just talk you have to laugh you have to smile you have to make funny noises like it, it's a it's a uh, it's an oral experience and so anything more you can do besides just going Bueller Bueller <laughs> right right <laughs> um, make sure um, uh, your subject matter is engaging um, make sure um, you change it up enough to get interviews and stuff like that I would argue that most podcasting tip sites say interviews are the best way to channel interest mm -hmm. on your show even though we do a lot of talking head stuff, we're looking, you know, we're looking to get interviews more back in the mix again, because um, we feel like we let the show drift into being kind of a laundry list. And we say this on the next show, which is our two year, well, this show, actually, it's our yeah. two year anniversary, that um, basically uh, half the show or more, we're advertising for other people. Nobody can see the content we're talking about. Right. It's just kind of not... Um, it doesn't really lend itself to a podcast yeah. format. Right? Well, it's not where we want to be with the show. So, yeah. So yeah. If, if we're going to constantly innovate. And that's another thing. you got to constantly evaluate what you're doing and whether it works or not. Yeah, for sure. And don't be was, afraid to change it if, it, if yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, that was one of the things I struggled with initially coming up with this. It's like I wanted to have like a podcast version, but then like most of it is predominantly going to live on YouTube because I want to have a very visual aspect to it. Because you're right, yeah. like... Um, I mean, I personally love listening to the podcast like while I'm customizing and stuff and it's great. Um, it makes me feel like I'm more immersed in the world while I'm doing that. And um, But I do also appreciate being able to see what people are talking about, you know, while the show's going. I, I of course, I look up things that you guys talk about all the time. Um, so that was one of the things I struggled with with this show was like, I was like, I want to do a podcast, but I also feel like it would be better visually too, so. Yes, yes. I, I, would, I would argue um, the best in the biz for that kind of thing is Stormy Strike, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She gets in there and hardcore edits and gets the, the, the product 
features in there and discusses them intelligently and and you know if that's what we were going for that's what we would need to do but that's her domain and she's good at it and we don't we really don't want to do that. that's not something we're good at yeah right? and it's not it's not our brief right that's yeah. not where we saw the show going so yeah. yeah so moving out a little bit as we wrap up here um out of the podcast realm of things um I've been interested in this question because I really want to know what do people want to see more of in the hobby? What do we feel like we're lacking in? <laughs> oh, trend um, prediction. <laughs> I, I personally think um, at Namo Pamo showed a big bright spotlight on the lack of, um, for lack of a wetter word, the lack of entree into being an artist in the hobby. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were intimidated to get started, intimidated to put themselves out there. Um, I think as the hobby uh, goes along, there's a lot more interest in being creative and less interest in, in consuming, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think the hobby wants more creativity. They want more interactivity. They want more sisterhood or brotherhood or whatever and less of the competitive acts, the look at me, that this costs $15,000 Alvarozo or $22,000, yeah. that kind of thing. I, yeah. um, the, the economy is not what it used to be. Um, and uh, I, I believe that there is a return and this is happening in the design world too, to move away from uh, mass commoditized creative and make stuff that's more bespoke, something that you can, um, you can uh, express yourself more. So yeah. that's what I think. What do you think, Jackie? I have no freaking idea. I'll be <laughs> completely honest. <laughs> well, I mean, because and, and some of that's because uh, I just, I mean, my big touchstones to the hobby right now are the podcast, you know, and Briar Fest, just because my, I work at alternate week. Everybody knows this because I complain about it every single episode. Um, <laughs> but I work every other weekend and it's it seems like my area the shows that shows that happen either happen on a weekend i'm working and trying to change a weekend is a big pain for me because i work both the days of the weekend saturday and sunday and trying to find coverage for both days is tough or it's um you know or there it, it's you know it's an of plastic collectability show which is great but that's not a show <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know um so and so i've been a little disconnected i'm you know I haven't really shown, I showed at the Jennifer show, but I definitely did not feel up to my A-game because I hadn't really been showing. Yeah. For quite that a was while. a tough show to come back in. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You know? And I think um, the Jennifer show is a great example if you are going to show. Destination shows. Yeah, definitely. It shows. But all the shows the I have been. I have been. I've been to more shows in Colorado than I have been to Region 9 in the last two years. <laughs> Shows with irregular, innovative class lists, shows that are have a, a, become an event in itself around the show. Um, of course, COVID crapped all over that yeah. this year. So but nobody's showing this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Briar West was the last one, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's sad because I agree. I think those kinds of shows are the best. <laughs> So it'll be interesting to see how it returns when it returns. Yeah. What form it's going to take. Because I also think, um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of mixed emotions bringing this up, but I mean, I also think that the focus of, of NAMSA and how important it is to have a qualifying show to go to the big dance at the end of the year, you know, I think that has gotten de emphasized a lot, you know, and being in them having to, you know, cancel this year or they're calling it a postponement but it's postponed to 2021 yeah. um and they you know the year before they had to cancel because they tore down the hall and you know they've had some stumbling blocks in their way that has had you know is haven't been their fault and i just wonder you know going forward just where that organization is gonna gonna end up yeah i agree i think it kind of goes back to needing to adapt. I think if mm -hmm. they don't adapt, then then we will kind of see like the publication side of things. Like there's going to be less interest because all of our interests are changing and shifting. And and if they're not like in touch with that, just like any company in the world, really, if you're yeah. not in touch with what they right, want. Right. And I, honestly, that's been Namsa's issue for a long time. Is mm -hmm. it's slow to adapt? Yeah. It's slow to adapt. It it cares too much about 
people that 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 will never ever help that will never <laughs> ever help i mean i think part of the the successfulness if you will of sarah parr is she just plowed ahead and did what she wanted yeah. and um i didn't always agree with what she does or handles things but i think um on, on a grander scale, she's engaged and made NAMSA a little more relevant again because I it, there was a there was a real danger of it just flickering out. Yeah. So, I mean, I think something like that has to be a benign dictatorship rather than an elected board. And I, I mean, there's historical reasons why it developed the way it developed and why it's, it's slow to change. That was kind of baked into it um, because at the time, internet was new. You know, West Coast, East Coast. There was, there was, there were very different showing cultures in this country regionally, and it's it's much more homogenized now um, because of Dansa, yeah, because of the mm -hmm. internet. Um, you know, but there so there are reasons it was set up the way it, it did, which worked in the '90s, which don't really work today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting deep now. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> okay. Um, what does the hobby mean to you guys? What has it done for you guys in your life, lives? <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, I met my best friend in the world through the yep. hobby. Even though I thought she was a monster when I thought first met her online. Um, I thought she was obnoxious. Oh, I, I, I kind of <laughs> am. Um, I, you know, I'll own that. That's fine. Um, but Heather and I have, you know, been through some stuff you know and it's it, you know we've had that person to kind of go and lean on you know through all kinds of things and i would not have that without i guarantee you i would not have that without the hobby yeah yeah i mean i i, I would say very much the same thing this is our tribe there there are tribes within the tribe mm -hmm. don't get me wrong and there are some tribes i would like to shoot off to the moon but <laughs> but you know i, I and I tell women this especially, the bonds you form with your women friends the older you get become more and more important. Because it gets um, much harder to make friends as you get older too. It's it much harder to make friends. Um, you lose that, uh, that oh, most people, most women lose the, um, I, I gotta have a man syndrome, you know, and the boys are all consuming. That, that mellows out as you get older, whether you get married or not, whether you're gay, gay mm -hmm. or straight or whatever. Um, and the bonds that you form with your women friends become super important and they become your support system. Like your partner, of course, will be too, but you know, when, the older I get, the more I love my model horse friends. Mm -hmm. like, I don't even go to shows to really show anymore. I just want to see them. Yeah. yeah. Like it's nice to win, but it doesn't define me. Right. Right. right cause the stories <sighs> I'm telling later are about, you know, what dumb thing we did at dinner or, you know, what stupid jokes we yeah. were telling each other at three o'clock in the afternoon when everybody was, you know, strung out after showing all day. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I, yeah. I mean, the, the, some of the best memories from shows are at the dinners afterwards yeah. or, you know, when you have a house full of people and you sit around and drink wine and just blah, 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 you know, I, it's, the, the showing's fun, but the showing is a, now just a launch pad for kind of a social experience. It's an excuse to get together. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, wrapping up now, um, what are your guys' future goals for the hobby? And this could be for the podcast or just individually. I think we covered the podcast with the vision. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I feel like as far as the hobby goes, I feel like I'm in a little bit of a state of flux. Um, I really enjoy performance showing. I have some really hot performance horses that I haven't gotten to show. <laughs> and it's been years. It's been years for some of them. Um, and it's getting tougher for me to find, you know, the show that I can take them to. And uh, I would, I would like to do that, but I, I just, I don't, you know, photo showing doesn't do it for me. It, it takes a lot of time yeah. to set that up. I'm used to very much like, you know, bam, this goes together in 10 minutes, rip it down, put it back, you know, that, that, that time element, I, is something I enjoy. Um, I kind of like being under pressure and, and doing stuff like that. And you don't have that in the photo showing. And then you send the photos off and you don't see what else is there. And, uh, you know, yeah. um, I am a super competitive person. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Every go oh, good, good. It's okay to be competitive, everyone. I mean, I will compete over the dumbest things. We had a, I had a thing at work one time. I had a boss who wanted us all to do our records better, and he was like, "Well, every week I'm going to pull people's record charts and look and see how well you did your record keeping, and you know, assign points, and you'll get a Starbucks card." And the other two people who I worked with were like, "Oh, come on!" 
on, you know, we're professionals. We don't need this. And I was like, I'm getting this star. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> yeah. And I went it three weeks in a row and then they stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> they said, this cannot be just for Jackie. They're like, they're like, she's the only one who's changed. <laughs> It's all depending on how you're motivated, I guess. I know. I'm like, the same way, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, low stakes trivia game? I'm coming for blood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can be competitive, um, but that's not... With the hobby, I'm, I really... I really don't feel that fire anymore. Even if, even if I'm in a, a class where I absolutely 100% disagree with how it went, whether I did well or not, because I'm a judge, I you can, usually can call how I think a class should go. Mm -hmm. And if it goes way off the rails from that, I'm unhappy. I'm happy for whoever I thought should have won. Um, but I'm not usually just like, hey, I'm not doing well, so I'm not having a good time, right? Um, yeah. I keep threatening to do performance again, but I think realistically that's probably not gonna happen for a been while, if ten, ever. 10 years been hearing that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I went, I went full tilt boogie when I was younger and I won everything like Georgia region six in the nineties was the place to be for performance. And the Georgia showers were like Polly Cleveland and Elaine Sulcer. These are names that you don't hear anymore. Yeah, Michelle, you know, Michelle masters will Michelle bake in. Masters, time. Yeah. Michelle masters will probably still roast your goose in performance. So, but, but I burned out on it and I tend to be a person that once I master something, I have to go find something else to do, right? Performance for Jackie is therapy and it's something that she's constantly developing and strategizing. For me, it was a goal and I got that goal and I was done, right? Yeah. I mean, I kind of like, what I like to do is to do stuff way out of the box, you know, like that's why I have a sliding stop reigning horse who has you know, a National Merit right. Award in harness. Yeah, I mean, you're, Sandy Sanderson's the same way. Like, she'll take the, the the weirdest pose and be like, how can I spread this across 30 classes? Mm. Like, it is a quest. Yeah. And I admire that sort of thing, but that's not me. Um, I've threatened to get, you know, start painting or start doing something and I don't do any, you know, I, I just don't have time or the will or whatever. So, yeah. um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, the podcast is a really big focus for me as far as fulfilling like uh, a need to, to contribute in the hobby. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna do that and hope I can retire from my job and, and at some point. Yes, please. <laughs> um, because- jobs are stupid. Jobs are stupid. Um, and then maybe I'll reevaluate when I don't have a full-time job if I wanna do something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'll let the- uh, leave this last part for you guys. Plug the podcast, plug everything, Woo! tell people where they can find you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can listen to us at uh, maresandblack.com. You can subscribe to us on Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere fine podcasts are sold. Uh, <laughs> free. Um, you can email us at info at maresandblack.com. Uh, we are on Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, more so on Facebook and Instagram and less so on Twitter and YouTube. Yeah, I mean, Facebook, and I don't know if you found this as well, Facebook and Instagram seem to be the platform for mm -hmm. model horse hobbyists. So, yep. so, and we're mares in black across all of those. Yeah, you were, you were easy to find. Thank you guys so much for watching. That was the episode. Definitely go ahead and check out the Mares in Black podcast if you haven't already. I will leave all of Heather and Jackie's links down below for you guys to check out. I know they have a photo show going on that they just announced as well that um, wasn't talked about obviously when we filmed this back in June, but if you guys are interested in another great photo show opportunity, definitely go ahead and check out that. If you're interested in any behind the scenes content for the show, go ahead and follow my Instagram. It's Frost Studios Equine Art. Stay tuned for next week's episode featuring Elena of Sugar Sweet Studios. And just like her studio name indicates, Elena is such a sweetheart. I had such a nice time sitting down and talking with her. So you're definitely going to want to tune in next week for that. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.